Right. <clears throat> Hello everybody, this is Charles one k 2 and today is week 5 of our Assassin's Creed Origins Countdown. So, we're here, last week, week 5. What does this mean? Well, we're on Syndicate. We're now in the Victorian era, the Industrial Revolution is taking place, and two twin assassins are going to rock London's world. So, let's try and go through this as best as we can. So, why Syndicate is the question. Why would you name something for a game called The Syndicate? Well, apparently for The Syndicate meaning, it's supposed to be a collaboration of people aiming for the same goal, or end goal. Now, both Jacob and Evie are the two assassins that we relive the life of during the events of the Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Now, why are we in England? Why are we in London? And why are we going through the Industrial Revolution during the time of the Victorian era? Now, at this point, London in itself is the capital of not just England, but in the sense of the world for industry and wealth. Its trade is booming. The populace is experiencing a change of times. Religion has now become, in somewhat terms, obsolete. It doesn't function the way it needs to anymore. Why do we need to go to church when I can have people going to work? Industry is booming. London is growing. And the people, well, from the higher up of the echelon, are experiencing so much wealth that it's unthinkable. However, the poorest people, the ones who work in the factories, are experiencing hard labour, and the sounds of work, and their children are in that workforce as well. So, child labour is the norm. But, times are changing, things have to change, oppression has to end. So, with Assassin's Creed Syndicate, we kick off with something quite unique. So, it's going to take me just a few seconds. Right, so in any case, I did kind of get ahead of myself with this, but you know what, we're going to crack on. So, Assassin's Creed Syndicate released worldwide on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One on October 23rd, 2015. So, it's been two years almost. Well, no, it has been two years. I don't know why, where I got the almost from, because we've just gone past the almost year. So, it's been two years since the game has been released. Fuck me. So the Assassin's Creed Syndicate, two years old, so we've they've had two years to work on Origins. So, along with this, the game came along with a few DLCs. Came with the dreadful crimes where we can investigate like we did in Unity, which I never talked about and I never want to talk about Unity ever again. It also came up with another DLC called The Last Maharaja. There was also the DLC of Jack the Ripper. And finally, Timing on it, timing on these. Now this is something which takes place in main game, but we won't talk about it just yet. Now, when we first play the game, we are treated to see an Indian assassin who's living in London, going by the name of Mr. Henry Green, very English name, albeit he's from India. And he's talking and he's writing a letter to the Assassin Brotherhood, which is somewhere in the UK in England, begging for aid that London is that London has been taken over by the Templars and it's been the Templars' home for over a hundred years. Causing a lot of changes. Led by one man, Crawford Starrick. Crawford Starrick is the Grand Master of the Knights Templar of Britain. And through his leadership, he has become the most cruelest man. Even crueler than Reginald, Reginald Birch, who took Haytham Kenway in when Haytham was little. Now, through this, he controls London through all bits of society, through the higher-up classes in Parliament to Her Majesty the Queen Victoria, 
to even the gangs of London known as the Blighters, and leaving other Templar officers in charge of them as well. So, Crawford has got his hands in everything, and he controls it all. So, and the phrase goes, as it is, he who controls London controls the world. Now, London is very powerful, because everything goes through there. So, if, if Crawford Starrick is in charge of it all, he can dictate what happens in the world. And the most simplest form of this is through tea. So, why tea? Tea is a very British thing, very English. So, where does the tea come from? Well, tea from India. So, Crawford has got factories in England and in India, and he's got plantations in India. He can get his people working there from India, picking up the tea, going through the process from making it into tea leaves, packaging it, sending it all the way around the world to England, to London, where it arrives from the docks. He gets people from his factory to still pick it up, process it even more, package it in a much more nicer box, send it to his house where he lives. His servants then take it, put it in his pantry, and then when he asks for it, it's delivered to him in a nice china cup and teapot and tray, and served to him with some sugar and milk should he wish to take it. This miracle, this tea. All people working and belonging to him. Basically, he says, not only will I have the people working for me, staying in work in my factories until they die, but I'll have their children, children's children working for me. So he wants to see people working for him. The pay will be terrible, but it's work. Anyway, that's Crawford Starrick. You'd think he's a good guy, but he ain't. So, we need to head over to our two assassins that we'll be playing as. And yes, I did say two. We're not playing just the one, we're playing two. These two are twins. One Jacob, one Evie. Born on November 9th, 1847, in Crawley, in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. So, they are both in charge of, or they're both affiliated with the Assassin Brotherhood in the UK. They are also in charge of the Rooks Gang. They are part of the Order of the Sacred Garter, which Her Majesty the Queen bestowed upon them. And they are also part of a club called the Ghost Club, led by Charles Dickens. So, there is this. Now, between the two of them, although they're twins, their personalities differ a lot. So, I'm going to take a look at Jacob. Jacob I kind of like a lot of, although he's an idiot. So, Jacob is this fine chap up here. So... Who is he? What is he? He is an assassin, and we're going to go with a conversation that they've kind of um, had with each other. This is both Evie and Jacob. Evie quotes, "You're relentless, Jacob. That relentlessness will see that relentlessness will see me become master when we finish this." Evie responds, "George would George would allow nothing of the sort. Whatever's left of the creed would perish under your control." So. Jacob likes to play around. He likes to get away with stuff. He never follows the creed. Throughout his time when we play Syndicate, he's against it every step of the way. He won't break the tenants, but he doesn't like... What is it now? He doesn't really like the whole bullshit. He just wants to be able to go and do as he pleases. I'm no criminal. I just do what I please. Which is true. He does go around and does what he please, but as long as he has some form of self-control, which he doesn't. So, he's always interested about killing the Templars. He doesn't care about the pieces of Eden. He doesn't care about the... Well, he does care about saving people, but he doesn't really care that much at this stage of the game. Evie, on the other hand, is the complete opposite to Jacob. She follows the rules and letters of the Creed exactly as it's written. So, she's also a headache as well. She's clever, she's intelligent, but she doesn't allow emotions to get in her way. Whereas Jacob, he is emotional, he does have emotions and he does care. It's just that his his attitude to it all is just a, it's for a laugh, it's for fun. Whereas Evie is stuck up and tight-lipped. And eventually she forms a, a loving fascination with Mr. Henry Green. Oh please Mr. Green, please Mr. Green, but how can we talk about this Mr. Green? Jacob taking a piss out of Evie. So, <clears throat> they both kind of get on each other's nerves, but they also know they can't bear without being with each other and they both care about each other so if anything happened to Jacob Evie will lose her shit anything happens to Evie Jacob would also lose his shit along with Mr Green so 
Why London? Well, London is the power is now a powerhouse for Templar control. They are everywhere, these Templars, in all society. And the Assassin Order couldn't even set foot there. Although Mr. Green's there as a spy, the Templars are trying to track him down as we speak. So it's like he doesn't have long left. So, the first time that we play as Jacob and Evie, they are both tasked with killing two Templars that are near Crawley, that are doing some experiments. So, <clears throat> now when they are there, they're there with um, somebody called George, who is a master assassin, who is telling Jacob and Evie their two targets, and they're on a train going through. Now, he likes the two twins, he's raised them and he's looked after them since their parents have, are both dead. But, he can also see in them their parents, so the father and the mother as it were. And he just wished that they'd listen to him once, and once every now and then. But, George hasn't got a spine anymore, he's like a pathetic assassin to an extent. He doesn't want to challenge the Templars, because he doesn't think it's ready. And he will only follow whatever the council says, so it's like... Dude, sometimes you just don't listen to them, you just do it. So, <clears throat> just trying to go through this. Right, so, Jacob's target is somebody called Rupert Farris. And then Evie has her target, which is Dave, Sir David Brewster. So in any case, so when they infiltrate, Jacob has to go through the ironworks while Evie stays on the train that they were both on to head to David Brewster's hideout where he's experimenting with a piece of Eden. Now, Jacob eventually makes his way through the ironworks and you can see the oppression that Mr. Rupert Ferris is doing to the people that he's in charge of. We assassinate him and basically Jacob is kind of, in a sense, telling him the way how it all must end, that he must die, everything must go back to the way how it needs to be. Rupert Farris says, so what if you kill me? I'm just a small cog in the grand scheme of Crawford Starricks. I will be easily replaced. And what you assassins going to do from Crawley, eh? Skulking in the shadows? You are nothing. So, that's that. Evie then makes her way to David Brewster, or Sir David. Sir David Brewster is a scientist, and he is experimenting with one of the pieces of Eden that they acquired. So obviously, I don't think this is going to be Altair's piece of Eden, because that is still hidden at Masyaf. It can't be Ezio's one, because that is also still hidden at... Where is it at? It is in the Colosseum. So this piece of Eden is new. Now, I'm quite in a sense to believe that this could actually be a piece of Eden that only the monarchy of Great, of Great Britain would have had control. Or it might have been actually Napoleon's piece of Eden that they experimented on. It just depends on which one. So, in any case, they're experimenting with it, trying to unlock something. Giving it electricity and whatnot, because we're now at the point where electricity is now in, and everything else. So, things are changing. And what happens is, eventually, Evie kills David Brewster. She's got him there and he's slowly dying so she says to him that she will continue his experiment to find out what's, what they're up to but she also wants to dismantle it at the same time and the templars rule so david brewster says that you know what you can't stop crawford starrick his vision and goal is a simple one it's your assassins that are the problem but then evie does also say this that he that she that he knows that he's dying and she says, you do not need to be afraid. And he says, I do not fear death. I believe God will look after me once I am gone. And whatnot. So eventually, he does die. And like Evie and Jacob, well, both Evie and Jacob do this. They actually do something which we haven't seen since the first game, where they swab the neck of the person they've assassinated. So generally, the assassins go for the neck. They swap the neck with the person's blood to confirm the kill. Similar to how Atoyer would have done with the feather, but they do this with a white handkerchief. So then, after this, they kind of get scolded by George, and he goes off. So then Evie and Jacob are standing there in Crawley, just going, So, London. 
should be go. And it's kind of like, let's. So they board a train heading towards London and they're in one of the stations there, probably Piccadilly or whatnot. And so many people. Now, these two, they have never really been anywhere this big before in London. So when they're there, they're kind of overwhelmed with the excitement. And to put it bluntly, it's a big thing. Jacob gets his money stolen from one of the kids, because kids are used to steal, pickpocket and whatnot. So he chases after the kid. He counters with some of the blighters, which he kills with ease. And then eventually, um, I think he gets his money back, I'm not too sure. Evie then finds him, and they decide to have a bit of a race towards a much more high point of vantage. Jacob wins, and then they first encounter with Henry Green, an assassin who's stationed in London to prove to have a spy network and also to relay information to the Assassin Council. Now, to Henry Green's surprise, he thinks that Jacob and Evie are here upon the Council's wishes. And both Jacob and Evie are going, yeah, we're here for that. You know, we want to liberate London. So, Jacob then has this fascination of having his own gang. And Evie is telling him, no, you're not having a gang. We need to do this. But we need to get London from the ground up. Which Mr Green is actually agreeing with. He says, if you're able to start from the bottom and you work your way up through society, then yes, this would work. So then, the thing that Jacob does then is that he names his gang the Rooks and it's like oh. really but in any case so Evie and Jacob then have a split well, not split decision but their ideologies somewhat change but they will eventually meet up so Jacob is more in line with the Rooks and he wants them to prosper and he wants to be in charge Evie also is in charge of them, but generally it's Jacob's order. It's Jacob's thing. Evie, on the other hand, is more annoying with Mr Green. She wants to find out where the piece of Eden is in London that is very important that the Templars are trying to find, both in Victorian times and in modern day. But we're going to look at modern day in a minute. So, Evie is working with Mr Green, and eventually they have to find their way to to Edward Kenway's home, which is in London, which is Kenway Manor, which is still under Templar control. It's exchanged so many hands since then, since Edward's time and Hathen's time, that it's generally a Templar stronghold. They couldn't even get near it if they wanted to, but they did at some point. So, <clears throat> with Jacob doing what he's doing, causing distress within the city, using his gang to upset the Blighter's territory, it loosens the Templar's control and grip. So, gang. So, in a particular way, although he doesn't have, although they don't have, let's say, the political stance to do anything to Crawford Starrick in a sense, but they're undermining his rule by getting rid of his gangs in London and taking over each borough, and they're quite successful in this. Eventually, they realise that the Blighters are actually in control by Templars themselves, and the Blighters are being paid and everything else to basically ruin the city. <coughs> Ooh, that's me. So, <clears throat> where was he? Blighters, yes, territory. So, the Blighters then use certain things to have their control. They basically transfer goods, they also undermine populace, they also have other gang leaders that are in charge that have committed different crimes, which you work along the line with Mr. Aberline, who is an inspector for the polit for London's Metropolitan Police or police as it were. So, Aveline tasks you to do this. If you can find people that are really most wanted and you capture them and you bring them back to me, that's one less problem for me to worry about. And it will show you in greater standing with the police force. So it's like, okay, but we will, but there is one thing though, although that you're doing what you're doing, I, I can turn the blind eye, but my other officers probably won't. So, you know, do what you need to do but within the reasons of the law. The good reasons, not the bad. So it's like, okay. Because Mr. Aberline is someone who's very good at disguising. And he shows off at one point disguised as a fucking decrepit old woman. And it's like, Jacob takes the piss out of him for it and whatnot. Evie does as well at times. Uh, we also come across with Mr. Christopher Bell, I think that's his name, who is an inventor. And he helps develop some new gadgets for the assassins. So one of said gadgets is actually 
a, grip, a grappling hook, which one of the Templars was using to upscale buildings, but once he was killed, Jacob was thinking about having it attached to his wrist. Crawford Bell, Mr. Bell says, you know what, I can actually sort this out. Well, he's, um, I can't do a Scottish accent that well, but he's a Scottish guy who's in London. And what happens is, he creates something for both Jacob and Evie. But basically, Evie's the first one to get this, and she uses it to do what she needs to do. Eventually, Jacob gets his own. And then eventually, another invention is made from Christopher, or from Mr. Bell, should I say, which is a poison dart, similar to what Ezio had, but this one has a different sort of thing. If you fire it in, let's say, a fire bin, the smoke that will dissipate out of there is like a poisonous gas, which will then infect anybody surrounding that area, which is another good thing. There's also smoke bombs and throwing knives, which the assassins already have got, but there's another grenade, which is an electrical grenade. And the assassins are given special kind of boots to absorb the electricity and not let them get damaged. So, if let's say they were to drop the big grenade next to them on their feet, they won't take the damage, but the surrounding enemies and people near them will. And I've lost my balance. So there's that. Now there are there is an upgraded system which was similar to that of Unity, and you can change your outfit, but it wasn't like you can customise it, it was select outfits, and each outfit had their own thing. And also there was a, a skill tree as well. You had a tree for your rooks where you could have different kind of rooks that you can have in your employment. You can upgrade the level of your rooks so they're much more stronger level and they can last in combat. You can also give them pistols as well, tell them when they can fire and whatnot, how many rooks you can recruit towards you at any given time, and also certain rook carriages that you were able to take control of as well and use to hide away in. Similar to what the Blighters had as well. So, <clears throat> What else is there? Yes, there was new ways of the assassination kind of stuff as well, and combat as well. And each of the assassins, both Jacob and Evie, had their own skill or personal traits. Evie, who is more in kind of the assassin way, she's more focused on stealth. She's more focused on mainly assassination and relying on her skill set. Same way as Jacob is, but Jacob is more of a fighter and a brawler, so he's able to have more health. He's able to take more and more damage. He's also able to cause more... Uh, mutilation to the opponent than let's say Evie would and he's also able to be uh, more brash and more heavy hitting because at the end of the day he's a brawler and a fighter whereas Evie is much more stealthier and sneakier and killing with the blade and whatnot. So that was one thing that changed. Another thing which was changed was at the combat as well. This time now in order for you to make any form of headway against your opponent your opponent is now able to block your attacks. So even if, let's say, you're equipped with a sword cane, or no, the cane sword, or the Kirker knife, or even knuckle dusters, if the enemy has blocked you, you're not going to do much damage. You have to break their block. So you break the block, you can cause a mutilation to their face, and whatnot, and continue your attacks. And there was a unique way of how you finished off your combos. So if you had, let's say, four guys around you, and they were sort of low on health, you could instantly kill all four of them with just one more move. So if everything's all highlighted, let's say using the Kirker blade, you basically would throw the blade, perhaps move the other guy near where you threw the blade, stab them both, pay your attention to the next two, stab them with maybe your hidden blades, go back to your Kirker, slit their throats, and that would be it. Cane sword, roughly the same thing, and with the knuckle dusters as well. Although the hidden blade might be used more with the knuckle dusters. <clears throat> so, there was other competitions that went around London as well. You had underground fight clubs, you also had street racing from point A to point B, and laps, which was using carriages and horses. You also had uh, other side quests as well with other notable figures like Charles Darwin, Charles Dickens, uh, you had, the, you had uh, the Abilene who you helped with the police force, you had Olivier who was one of the children that you actually helped free, liberate those that were in child labour industry areas which the Templars had under their control. Uh, you had Ned, who was somebody who knew a lot more about London Underground System that was eventually going to be invented and London Transport, so you helped her out on that. And basically, as you were going through each of the stages of helping them, you upgraded your... not upgraded, it was basically levelling out their, um... What was it now? I won't say friendliness meter, but more or less their allegiance towards you. Although Henry Green is an assassin and he's obviously going to be on your side, you still had to build up his trust so that he was able to give to you uh, rewards for your service to the to the game or not, not to the game to the thing and there was also a crime murder mystery thing that you can go around London and you can solve crimes and whatnot and which gave you an unlock of a rare item at the end but anyway getting back to the story so 
Jacob is on his way, and every single time that he comes across a new Templar, he wants to kill them, which he does. But he never deals with the consequences afterwards, he just kills and moves on. Whereas with Evie, after she goes and does what she does, she then has to pick up the slack that Jacob left. So, let's take Lambeth Asylum for example. There was a Templar there who was constantly working on live patients, and killing them in the process, experimenting on them. So when Jacob makes his way into Lambeth, there was a new thing called Soothing Syrup, which was actually making the, making the citizens of London thick, dumb, like devoid of any life or emotion. So Jacob decided to go after the guy who, in a sense, is selling it. Well, it isn't the doctor, scientist or whatnot. It is... I'm just trying to find out where this is. So, let's see... Uh... He later found John an argument with Simon Richard Owen. Yes, Jacob chased and hijacked. Owen revealed and created the suit, which is Elliotson. Oh, yeah, John, Dr. John Elliotson. So, Dr. John Elliotson is the Templar who is in charge of the soothing suit being released into London. So, eventually, Jacob makes his way into the asylum, pretending to be a corpse, and kills him with a hidden blade, the unique assassination takedown. This was also introduced in Assassin's Creed Unity, but I'll never talk about Unity ever again, thank you very much. And that was that. So you actually have like new methods of way of killing people now when you make your way through your assassination. So, Jacob took him down. And upon this, um, Dr. Eliasson there again accuses the assassin's way of going about things. What, with just a flick of a blade and killing someone, you think you're going to change the world? I think not. Did your father ever teach you nothing? Did, you, did your father teach you anything? Not nothing, shall I say. So, it's like, okay, prick. Anyway, so Jacob kills him and he go, he goes off and does his other adventure. When Evie arrives, the Lambeth Asylum is closed. And this leaves to Miss Nightingale, who is a real person, trying to pick up the, the broken pieces. Helping both children and other people in the area of the borough back to health. So, Evie goes out and collects what she needs and... That's it, it's all done, it's sorted. Eventually, this is a common pattern. Jacob goes and kills somebody. This, there's broken pieces everywhere. Evie comes along and tidies up after him. And this is a common trend. Now, for Evie in her side of the story, she tries to find out about this powerful piece of Eden that Edward Kenway discovered when he was living in London at the time, which is actually the Shroud of Eden. Now, they don't know where the Shroud is, but at least Evie's trying to track it down, and Jacob is constantly harassing her about, have you found it yet? Have you done it yet? Are you still doing stuff with Mr. Green? And whatnot. So, in any case, Evie eventually does find out what it is. It's a Shroud of Eden, it's a very powerful piece of, uh, piece, uh, piece of Eden, uh, but the assassins just need to know where it is. And eventually, it does lead them to Buckingham Palace. But where, exactly? Well, it leads to the underground vault. Of it, so there's a vault underneath it, which causes them to, which causes the assassins having to try and sort everything out. So then, at this point, the assassins have eradicated most of the Templar presence. So Crawford Starrick uh, has, you know, is starting to see that the assassins are now undermining his authority quite a lot, and eventually it causes him to lose quite a few people of his in, in his life. One of which I think is his sister, I think, and Miss Thorne, who I think he had a predominantly a certain relation with. Then eventually he then decides to do the only thing he can do, since he's the only Templar left in London. He attends he attends a a ball which is taking place in Buckingham Palace. Now Jacob isn't invited, neither is Evie, but they steal some invitations and they gain access. Their weapons have been stripped from them, so they're dressed quite formally. Evie is dressed quite nicely, Jacob is also quite, uh, is somewhat dressed in a decent way, and Abilene has decided to dress himself up as a royal guard, or the, or the guard of the Grenadier, and he says to meet Jacob on the rooftop of Buckingham Palace. So Jacob eventually gets there, he changes into his assassin gear, and everything else. And he has Evie's equipment with him as well, so it's like, it's all here. Whenever Evie's ready to do what she needs to do, just go and do it. So Jacob um, then notices that there are Templar snipers all around Buckingham Palace. And you can see that Evie has actually is with Crawford Starrick, and the pair of them are dancing. 
Now Evie's got a key to gain access to the vault and also uh, the Shroud of Eden through like, as you go through the game eventually you find a key which is I think in St. Peter's, um, it's in one of the, it's actually found near one of the cathedrals I think. St. Paul's, there we go, not Peter's. So it's found at St. Paul's Cathedral. She then encounters Miss Thorne there at that time, but eventually she kills her at the Tower of London and takes it back. In any case, trying to continue on with the story, making it a long story go short. So eventually, while she's with Crawford, um, he's turning around saying to her that everything constantly repeats itself. History just goes over and over and over again because you just learn it. But if you think... But then if you eventually learn the moves of the dance, as it were, of life, you're able to predict when things are going to happen. So that way, you're more ready for it. But in this case, he wasn't ready for Evie or Jacob. So it's like, he knew the assassins were eventually going to come, and he knew what would take place, but he didn't expect them to do what they did this time round. So this is something for them to learn again. However, as the dance finishes, Evie promptly kicks him in the balls quite literally. And she even quotes as saying, I really don't like balls. So it's like, okay, sexist joke, pun, even. But Crawford has already left and he's already taken the key and he's making his way to the vault. Jacob, on the other hand, has already killed the Templars posing as Grenadier guards and has allowed the, raw, the, raw, the real guards to take their positions. So Jacob then pursues the uh, pursues uh, Crawford Starrick. Now, Evie has already met the Queen of England at this point. So then she eventually decides to get rid of this contraption that she says off and wear her usual clothing. Jacob is now in the in the vault and he sees Crawford and he's already engaged. Now, in doing this, he's actually he realizes that every attempt that he makes to kill Crawford, he's not dying. Why is this? The Shroud of Eden heals any injuries that are inflicted upon the wearer. So a gunshot to the head, a stab in the heart, a, slap, a slit of the throat or slit of the wrist, nothing will happen. The person will constantly regenerate and they will live anything. As long as it's something non too um, damaging, like, I don't know, someone were to fire a cannon in your head, I don't suppose your head will magically regrow, but you know that hasn't actually been tested, I don't think. So, eventually Evie makes her way into the underground of where the vault is. And she has her turn of killing Crawford. Again, she realises that he can't, that she can't do anything. But eventually the pair of them do kill Mr. Starrick. With the help of Henry Green, who, as far as he, Henry Green's aware, he's not very good as being a field assassin. He's more of an intel kind of guy. Sit indoors, read, the pa read papers and everything else. But... He, he saved the mission, he saved the day. So, after this, both Evie and Jacob slash Crawford's Derek to death, almost. And then eventually, um, obviously he's dead, and the Shroud of Eden is now lying on the opposite side of Crawford. So, Jacob picks up the Shroud, looks at it, and thinks, hmm, all that power. Evie looks at him and says, so what are you going to do, you're going to rule London and never die? And he says, no. He puts it away where it was found and says, what are you? Are you going to do it? And she says, no. And what about the rooks? And he says, well, he wants to still be in charge, but he thinks he should tone it down a bit and whatnot. So he does. Evie and Henry Green have a kiss, showing finally their affection for one another. And then eventually they're done a great service to England and to Britain. So when they leave, Mr. Abilene has told Her Majesty the Queen what transpired. Now, my guess is that the Queen already knows about the vault, because again, she's the head of state, so of course she's going to know what's beneath Buckingham Palace. Or at least I think she does. So she then sees the three of them, and she then inducts them into the Order of the Sacred Garter. So it's basically like a very secretive organisation that... Well, not organisation, but it's just a thing. So I'll actually bring this up if I can. Order of the Sacred Garter. So, <clears throat> the 
The Order of the Sacred Garter is an order of chivalry within the United Kingdom. In 1868, following the death of the Grand Master of the British Rite of the Templar Order, Crawford Starrett, Queen Victoria invested the assassins Henry Green and Jacob and Evie Fry into the order as a reward for their part in ending Starrett's plots to claim the throne. So Crawford Starrett wanted to become king. The members of the order were granted the noble title as Sir and Ordain, depending on the gender. So Sir Jacob Fry. Dame Evie Fry. <laughs> so they kind of took the piss out of each other by saying this. And then in the end, uh, they do have a train which is under their sort of control, which goes around the London Railway Network. It's basically the HQ, but on wheels. And basically, they have a bit of a race at the end of the game. Now, you're probably wondering, well, is there a modern day to this game? There is actually, but again, it's still cutscenes. And we finally get to see what's going on. And instead of it just being Bishop constantly talking to us, it's not just Bishop this time, it's actually Sean and Rebecca. And we see them even in the beginning of the game. And they're the ones who get us to, who get us to play uh, Jacob and Evie at the beginning. Because they hack into an Abstergo mainframe in London somewhere to find this the Shroud of Eden. So Sean and Rebecca are technically, they're not field agents, they never have been as far as we were aware. They're more of stay indoors, work on the animus, deal with historian stuff and all that jazz. But Sean and Rebecca are there. And they decide to hang back because they know that a meeting is going to take place in the building soon that they're in. So they hide there and eat, uh, Rebecca sets up drones. Eventually, um, they see the person they need to kill. I think, uh, I can't, I think it's Elizabeth, is it? It must be. Is it better? I don't know. Anyway, she is Templar, and she is speaking to another Templar known as Dr. Grammatica, who is working on something new. Any case, Sean and Rebecca appear, and they say, it's people like you who give us historians a bad name. And she already knows who Sean is and Rebecca, and she says that she doesn't have time for you, Mr. Hastings. And then Sigma Team's leader, who is Otto Berg and his sidekick, eventually surround the assassins. So Rebecca has already set up an explosive and before they leave she does something behind her to activate it. The bomb goes off in a few seconds and they leap a faith out the window. So they get hunted by Otto Berg and his Sigma team unit. Then eventually they find themselves in a, tr in a very scrapped train yard somewhere in London and Sean and Rebecca are talking to Bishop saying you know you shouldn't really be doing this, you're being quite reckless. And they don't even know what they're after at this point. But whatever it is, it must be quite a powerful piece of Eden. But they do mention it's the Shroud. So it's like, it's the Shroud, so they must be really desperate to get this then. Because this piece of Eden isn't just something to neglect. So Bishop agrees and says the initiates are still working at it to find out where it is. Now eventually we get to the, another cutscene for the modern day, where it shows Sean and Rebecca at night. Rebecca's taking a, a rest while um, Sean is waiting for their assassin reinforcements. Now, Sean is then asked the question, you guys never have done this before, so why are you risking your lives now? And then Sean tells the story of Desmond, although a much more shortened version, and he said, someone that I knew, who we helped get him better, he did a lot of things for us. He, um, I didn't like him in the beginning because I thought he was little Jimmy special but he actually became one of my best friends over time and he sacrificed himself to save the world and I feel indebted to him to do what he did. So then eventually we hear a woman from the darkness saying you are a good assassin and it's Galina Voronina, Voronina a Russian assassin from the Russian branch of the Brotherhood. She is the same as Desmond, she went through the Animus but I think she's more of a stable person, and I think she could be the Eve to Desmond's Adam. So that's something he nor there. Now, she knows that Otto Berg is trying to kill both Sean and Rebecca. And she says that she knows that Otto Berg is here, and she will kill him for them. And he says, that's great. While you plan on doing that, I need to go down. I need to go and take a lie down somewhere and start crying because you scared the little jet out of me. So she says, get some rest. 
Then finally the day comes upon which where they know where it is. So they head to Buckingham Palace, the same place where Jacob and Evie were. So they are spying on Sigma Team's two leaders and the um, Elizabeth, so I think her name is. So then the assassins need to decide what to do. They said, well, we can't let them leave with the shroud. We can't let them get away. So the decision comes then from Sean, kill them. So smoke gas is thrown out for the assassin's advantage. Sean skulks around behind Elizabeth, who's holding the shroud, and he stabs her with a new hidden blade, which delivers an electronic charge. So I think she's dead as well. While Galena fights with uh, Otto Berg and the other uh, Sigma team cooperative, um, Rebecca is also about to... I think she was about to get shot, but... No, I think Sean was about to get shot, but Rebecca saves Sean's life again. Galena then realises that things are starting to go wrong and the rest of the Sigma team are coming in. So then, the Shroud then is taken. Uh, Otto Berg, I don't think he's killed, I think he's knocked out, but I have a feeling he might have been killed. So, Sigma team take the Shroud and leave. Although the remaining Sigma team wants to kill the Assassin Order, or at least what's left of it. So... The assassins then, well, Sean then is saying to Galena that we need an exit and fast. Rebecca is saying the shroud, we need to get the shroud, and Sean is saying, no, we need to look after you because you're injured. Stay with him. So Galena then throws another smoke grenade and she slowly kills Sigma team off one by one, causing us to finally end the cutscene. However, at the very end of the Assassin's Creed Syndicate, we meet Dr. Grammatica face to face, and he's working on rebuilding the first civilization from scratch, using any bits of DNA from John Stanish, who is Aita's descendant, who is technically Aita himself, but he's another copy or not, or hybrid. So in any case, he uses um, his DNA along with any other bits of DNA that he has to his hand. And then once this is done and he leaves, we see Juno appear again talking to this Abstergo agent who is actually part of the Order of the First Will, who are a group of people who believe that they need to be ruled over again by the Isu people, I guess, who are both from the Assassin side and Templar side have come together to do this new thing. And Juno says that she's going to save everyone, she's going to save the world and bring them into the Grey, which I think she's in, but she wants to have her own body as well. But that's where it ends. That's it. There is this time anomaly thing that also takes place during the game, similar to what they did with Unity, but in this case you relive the life of Jacob's granddaughter, who is Lydia, I think her name is, and this is during World War One. So this is the only game time period in the game where we get to go through World War One London, but near Tower Bridge and the Tower of London. And we're basically killing German spies and whatnot and helping Winston Churchill. And that's generally it. That is all it is. So that is Assassin's Creed Syndicate. A lot of things have changed since AC1, and it's been pretty good so far. Origins is looking pretty good too. Now, if I am right in saying this, it is the 25th, and I have a feeling that either today something might come in the post, or maybe tomorrow. So, in any case, I might be doing another video, well I will be doing another video obviously of the unboxing of Origins, but I think I might do another one which can go on a theory of mine that I've been thinking about Origins for a while, is upon how Bayek comes up with the idea for the Brotherhood. It's just my personal theory, and it's probably so many other people's theories as well, because it must have crossed anybody's mind how Bayek comes up with the Creed. So, I have been Charles 1K92. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. See you guys soon.